أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى إطرته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم لعنت الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد سلام عليكم ورحمة الله Amongst the qualities of the people who we find in Karbala at the side of Abu Abdullah al-Hussain alayhi salam is that they had a sincerity and ikhlas a purity of their niyyah that they were there for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and yesterday we looked at this idea that the weightiness of actions the merit of actions that we perform on a day-to-day -day basis is directly proportional to how much sincerity and ikhlas and God centeredness we can bring to that act the more sincere we are that we are doing this to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more worthy the act is. And we saw that this is not something that is without danger because it is something that alerts shaitan. And frequently, even as we mean to do good or we mean well, we start off a good action, we start action with good near. Along the way, it gets poisoned, it gets distorted. And if we are not careful at the end of it, we find that we have done many things, but they have no real, they were never dedicated to Allah at all. And so we have in effect wasted our time. So we have to be very careful that action is not tainted, tainted by the niya being changed halfway. The niya should be good to start, the niya should be good in the middle, and the niya should be good in the end. And the only way we can ensure that is by constantly checking to make sure, am I still doing it for the same reasons why I started it in the first place? Or has along the line my niya changed? In which case, I need to think carefully whether I want to continue with this activity and so on. <coughs> the other danger that is from other than shaitan <coughs> is the danger within because we have to be careful that there is a part of us that likes to be appreciated, that wants to show off, that wants to be, uh, you know, thought of as well, uh, as good. And so frequently, if we give in to this, if we give in to this temptation, then we lose our sincerity. Many acts which we have done, only we know Allah knows, and that is the best thing. Yet, in an attempt to let others also appreciate us, we make a mistake, we uh, sort of let others know of what we have done, and in that way we reduce the worth of it. And what we said was that the greatest value of an act is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the buyer of that act. Anybody else, anything else that someone else can give you does not equal even remotely what Allah can gives you, give you for this. So why do we satisfy ourselves with the respect admiration and good words of the people when we can have the respect, good word and admiration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should always be mindful that you don't inadvertently ruin the good act by yourself boasting about it, letting others know and so on. And if we ever do that, I want, you know, it's very useful to analyze it afterwards. That I did a good act. It was secret. Then I gave in to my, you know, desire. I told others, what did you get? Think of it. After you've done it, if you think, what did you get? Did they make you the president of Jamaat? Did they give you, you know, a lot of money? 
Did they give you? No, if you really analyze it, you really didn't get much. A few words like, mashallah, well done, brother, may Allah, you know, uh, forgive your sins or may Allah bless you. And so it's not anything compared to what Allah could have given you or Allah would have given you for that act. So we sold it cheaply. Now, a mu'min can make a mistake once, but a mu'min, according to hadith, does not make a mistake continuously. Right? So when you realize that it was all for nothing, I should have kept my mouth shut and I would have had something more precious to present to Allah, then we resolve not to make that mistake again. And we spoke about how to test our own ikhlas going in, and there are many things that happen sometimes that are tests for us. Like, for example, that we do something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the credit goes to somebody else. People say, oh, mashallah, this person did it. You know you did it. You put in all the hard work. It was your idea, your effort. Somebody else seems to be getting the credit. At that time, it's a testing time. It's a testing time. <coughs> what we are told is, say, alhamdulillah. Ya Allah, at least you know. Nobody can fool you. The people might not know. But you know exactly who did how much. In the same way, we have hadith. This is from Bihar. Al-Majlisi, alayhi rahma in volume 22, in hadith 304. He says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that... <laughs> that a person does not reach the reality of ikhlas unless he doesn't like people to praise him for the actions he has done for the sake of Allah. So people, when they say something to him, he thinks, Ya Allah, why did this person find out my contribution to this venture? If it, it would have been better if only you and I knew. He sincerely feels disappointed or, or a little bit upset that it came out, you know, and people got to know of his involvement because he wanted to keep that pure. Because once the people know, people know, people get to know things, uh, your sincerity is so detested. That is because people will praise you, and when people praise you, you are in the biggest danger. Believe me. You are in the greatest danger when someone comes and says to you, MashaAllah, you are a very good mu'min. And that is why we have a hadith that says, Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that throw, oh, sand. Oh, throw sand at the face of the flatterer or the one who flatters you or the one who praises you. Why? I mean, don't obviously do it physically. We're talking about it in a, in a, in a way that do not try to cultivate this kind of behavior in others that they keep praising you because it is detrimental to your akhlaq and to your own uh, ikhlas uh, in, in times to come. And we have a dua from Imam Sajjad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Where he says that um, Oh Allah, do not raise me in the eyes of the people until you lower me by the same amount in my own estimation. I think it is makarim al akhlaq Yes? That people may say anything, but I know myself. That means if people say well, you are like this, I shouldn't believe that. I should know where I am. Lower my own pride by the same degree so that I do not become a uh, prey to this. So we have to be careful that, you know, it, we should not go fishing around for compliments. It is a debt to the detriment of our own ikhlas and our own ikhlas. So when credit is given by to another person, and we said also one of the signs of ikhlas is you do not always feel that your words are necessary also in a, in a, in a situation where the truth has been spoken, the right act has been done by somebody else. You say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, my responsibility is over. Not that you feel that I want to also add to this or say this so that my name comes as one of the people who had a comment on this. No, this is not what it's about. So we have to at all times watch our ikhlas because ikhlas is valuable. When something of valuable is there, shaitan is there to steal it. If it is something of no value, he doesn't even bother with you. He doesn't bother with you. But when you have something valuable, his interest is aroused and he wants you. Even as you go to bank it, he robs it from you and makes it worthless. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us on this path of ikhlas. Not many things are required if we have ikhlas. Few things are required to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. But they have to be with ikhlas.
In today's hadith, I want to talk about the attitude of death. And we have, for example, the clear hadith from Ahlul Bayt This one I bring for, to you from Ali bin Abi Talib alayhi salam. <laughs> where he tries to explain what death is. You see, why do people not like death? Why do people fear death? You see, um, we all fear death because it is some, we, we, we believe it to be some sort of end. And our soul is not meant to die, and certainly our ego, which we've been talking about from time to time, is not prepared to die. Now, if we imagine that death is the end of matters, some sort of, you know, switch off, and that's the end, and there is no further life after that, then, yes, we should fear it. But Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Ayyuhan nas, inna wa iyyakum khuliqna lil baqa. Inna wa iyyakum khuliqna lil baqa. We and you have been created to survive, to live evermore. La lil fana, not to be destroyed, not for destruction. Lakinna kum min darin ila darin tun kalun. Except we are going to move from one realm to another realm. That's what we do. The soul of us gets transferred from one realm to another realm to another realm as we begin our journey back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It needs to be in different realms and that's what our soul does. It is not so much as dying. It is more like emigration. You leave one country to go to another country forever. It is just you are moving from one place which you will no longer go to, to another place which you will now live in. And of course, in his memorable, memorable speech on the day of Ashura, Sayyidu Shuhada says to his companions, Sabran Banil, Qira, Banil Kiram, he tells them that, Have patience, sons of noble men. He says, have patience, sons of noble men. Death is nothing but a bridge, but a portal that takes you from bo'si wa dhara, from problems and trials and tribulations and difficulties, ila jananin wasi'a, to huge gardens, wa na'im da'ima, and blessings that are continually pouring on you. For ayyukum yakrahu an yantaqil min as il qasr. Which of you dislikes to be taken from a prison into a palace? So, it is not that we need to think of death as something that is the end. No, death is a doorway and it's a procession and it's a movement and it's a journey and it's an exciting journey. Yes, what we have to be afraid of legitimately is that we are not prepared for that journey, for example that we enter into the other place, but we do not have the currency required there. So for example, I am going from here to another country, I will make arrangements that I have a hotel in that place, that when I get there, I have somewhere to live, I have the currency of that place, so I can spend money in all these areas. But what if I reach that place, and I have neither a board, nor currency, nor anything, then I'm in trouble, isn't it? Then I should be worried about that journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the Quran says that, look, in many, this verse comes in many different ways, several ways, but the message is the same. And he says, This world is a game. Okay, is a game. Now some of you might say, I'm going through so difficult time at the moment. How, how can Allah say it is a game? You know, my life is a misery. It's not a game. This is not game. This is real life, we call it. No. Play and game has got some purpose. You know, games have, have things that we learn from, that we gain from. But the one thing about games is that there is always another day. You know, nothing is final. You lose your game today, tomorrow you might win. It's not the end of the world. In the same way, in this dunya, we see peaks and troughs. We see good days, we see bad days. 
We see tough times, but we see the good times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the world like that. In Surah Al-Najm, for example, he says that Annahu adhaka wa abka. I am going to make you laugh and I'm going to make you cry. There will be days in your life when you will laugh in pure joy and delight. And there will be other days when you will cry bitter tears. This is the system of dunya. Annahu adhaka wa abka. Okay, it is a game because it is not the reality. It is not reality waits for us. Walal akhiratu Allah says in the Quran, hiyal hayawan. Real life begins in akhirah, not in dunya. So, these people, they understood the temporary nature of dunya very well. And so there was no problem when death presented to them and they had an opportunity to die well, to die on the correct path, to die a noble death, because everybody will die. There's no question about that. But to die a Muslim, you know, as Yusuf alayhi salam says in, his, in Surah Yusuf we had, he asked Allah, Tawaffani Musliman. When I die, make sure I die on Islam. That's all. Now, that is the best dua because it doesn't matter how you live, you die a Muslim. You die in submission. You die on the right path. And these people had an opportunity, they embraced it. Because they understood the temporary nature of the dunya. This is our biggest problem. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bal tu'thirun al hayat al dunya. This is in Surah A'la. Bal tu'thirun al hayat al dunya wal akhiratu hiya wal akhiratu khayrun wa abqa. You are engrossed in the life of dunya, but the akhirah also is better and everlasting. This is a temporary place. Why do you attach to the temporary place in this manner? You know, these things here that we find around us, um, they are not meant to be part of real life. They are props. We're in a testing place, in a gathering place. We need certain props. All right. So we need um, food. We need companionship. We need, um, you know, uh, transport, rain, whatever. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala makes intizam for this. That's all. But it was not the ultimate life. This is just what is needed. Like, like in an exam, you go in an exam. They make sure you have paper to write on. They give you pens. Or in this mudlis, I come here. There is a, a microphone. There's light, there's heating, right? Okay, why is these things necessary? It's necessary for the people to be comfortable for the mud list to happen. But when it's finished, these props are removed. Somebody comes and switches off the microphone, another person switches off the light. This is exactly what Allah says. When I finish with dunya, which is just a testing place, then I switch everything off. إِذَا الشَّمْسُ قُوِّرَتْ When I switch off the sun. وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ قَدْرَتْ When I fold up the stars. When I flatten the mountains, they are no longer needed. These things were dead needed for dunya. Now I am switching them off. Because now life is about to begin. Allah says, now I change the earth to a new earth. The real earth. In which everything has a higher level of life. Your own sensitivity to life is much greater. Rocks speak to you. Plants speak to you. Limbs speak to you. Yes? This is, this is what real life is. And we think we are in real life. We are not. If we understand that we are here temporarily, a lot changes. A lot. In the way that we have perspective in dunya, the decisions we make about dunya. Right? Say for example, say for example, as a family, I took my family, say, to, to uh, Florida, say. Okay, so we reached Florida, and now we're in the hotel. So one member of the family says, um, we're in Florida, we should go and check out Disneyland. Another member of the family says, we should go and meet our, you know, our friends and our relatives in this area. Maybe I say we should go and meet the Molanas, whatever. But one member says, no, I've got the best idea of all of you guys. So what? He said, look at this room. The paint is peeling. The carpet looks threadbare. The light is not working. The best idea is let's go to the DIY store. We go to the DIY store. We get some new carpet. We get some new lights. We make this place look real good. 
the other members of the family will tell him, are you out of your mind? First of all, this doesn't belong to us. This is not our place of living. Our home is somewhere else. Second of all, last week somebody else was in this room. Next week somebody else will be here. Third thing, we haven't come here to do this. We have come for another purpose. Something which seems so normal, so sensible in Florida. We are doing this in dunya. This dunya and the houses we keep and the buildings we buy and the things we embellish. Before us, somebody else owned them. When we go, somebody else will have them. We did not come here to get engrossed in painting things and building things. We came here for a purpose. Let us not lose, lose sight of that purpose. And when we lose sight of it, well, the days pass, the years finish. And when we look at what we achieved, well, nothing we can really take with us. You know, in Nahj Balagha, we have that Abir al-Mu'minin, alayhi salam. He visited a graveyard. And there was a companion with him, and he said to him, Bola, because he saw Imam was speaking to the, gra to the people of the graves, and he said to him, Bola, do they hear you? He said, Bola, they hear better than you. Better than you. They understand better than you. So Imam alayhi salam, during the course of that conversation with Ahlul Qubur, he says to them, O oh, people of the graves, it has been some time since we have spoken. Why don't we share news? I will tell you the news of this side, and you tell me the news of where you are. And then he said to them, I would like to tell you that the money that you spent all your life earning and guarding and preserving, I want to tell you that others are spending it now. Others. The houses that you built and you know, looked after with so much care, I want to tell you that others are living in them now. The women that you loved so much, that you spent all day trying to please, I want to tell you, others have married them. That is my news. What is yours? And this is what Mullah is saying. That everything for which in dunya you spend time is not anything you can take with you. Nothing you can take with you. You have to leave it behind one day and go. But when you go, you need to carry something. Because the, wherever you're going, there is a currency there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَتَزَوَّدُ Gather, gather provisions on this journey. That which you will be able to carry with you is that which you have acquired through your taqwa, through your God-fearingness, that you can carry with you. Everything else you are going to leave behind. And, and you know, it will be a very scary journey then, because you arrive at a place, you don't know you have the currency of that place. Of course you would be afraid. And that therein, I think, lies the main fear, the fear of the unknown. Well, it is unknown. Nobody's come back the other way. At least, you know, maybe in the olden days, one or two guys may have done, but nobody has really come back. Huh? You know, we sometimes, when they say, such and such person has died, we're going to keep the body, you know, in Stanmore, we're going to keep the body all night in the, in the mobile morgue we have there. Um, so can we have a couple of volunteers to sleep? because you shouldn't leave the mayat on its own. Most guys say, what? Sleep? No. <laughs> Why you don't want to sleep with it? No, I don't want to sleep next to a dead person. Papa, if he was alive, maybe he could punch you if you had a dis disagreement. He is dead. He cannot do anything. You can disagree with him all you want. No, 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 no. I'm not sleeping with a dead person. Why is this? Because we have totally... There is a part of us that is so scared of the unknown that what this person is going through. And we don't want to think about it. We don't want to, you know, even, even be close to it. We want to get out of there quick. And certainly about spending a whole night there, we don't want that at all. See, and this is something that we are filled with so much dread about, which is unnecessary. We have been told clearly, prepare for it. And when it comes, go through it. But prepare for it. One of the ways to prepare for it is to slowly and surely detach ourselves from these very strong attachments we have to our possessions, to things in dunya. I'm not saying become an ascetic. I'm not saying, you know, uh, do not do business. Do not 
you know, have aspirations about growth and so on in dunya terms. No. What I'm saying is that keep it in perspective. If it is there, it is there to serve a purpose. If it's not serving a purpose, get rid of it. Right? And it is this that makes death itself also, according to hadith, difficult. Why is death for some people very easy? And why is death for others so difficult in terms of the final moment? It is purely because the one who has no attachment can easily be taken. Can easily be, it's a fine, I'm not attached to anything, I move. <coughs> but suppose somebody is attached, well he's going to be grabbing on tight this way, and the angels want him to move through the portal that way. And that is why we have in hadith, or not in hadith, in Quran, Surah An-Nahl, that for some people the angel will say, Salaamun Alaikum, it is time to go, and they go. For others, it says the angels hit them on their back. Now, why would you hit someone on the back? Why? Think about it. Why would an angel hit someone on the back? Well, if, for example, he is behind you trying to shove you through the door and you are grabbing both sides of the door like this because you don't want to leave, what is he going to do? He's going to hit you in the back. Right? You know... Uh, some time ago, when I saw the first white hair in my beard, I realized that things aren't going now, not many years left. So the very next week, I booked a sky jump. I wanted to do one. So I said, I'm going to go up in the air two miles up and jump out on a parachute. So I did that. But when it came to actually jumping, you see, there is a little light that switches on. First of all, they open the door in a plane, which I've never had done before, which is very scary. They just open the door, and then you sit and you dangle your feet out of the plane like this, right? That itself is something else. And then there is a light, red, yellow, green. When it goes green, you have to jump. It went green. He's saying, jumper number two, please jump. I'm just listening to him, jump. <laughs> Behind me, the instructor came and kicked me out. Like <laughs> just kicked me. And I, the, the rest is history. Anyway, I was down there. When you're not ready to move, somebody has to hit you from the back to get you moving. Allah says some of the people will be like, why? Because dunya is everything to them. They cannot imagine that, hey, can someone else be in charge of my affairs? Impossible. Who will count the money? It has to be me. Who will sign? It has to be me. But you know what? When the time comes, you go. When you attach yourself, it makes no difference. These people are not going to listen to you. <coughs> These angels have been given a, a, a duty to do. They are not going to listen to anything you have to say. Arguing with an angel is a waste of time. See, it's like a man arguing with the one who's putting the noose in his neck and saying, please don't do this. And the one who's putting the noose in his neck saying, it's not me, you need to be arguing. It was the judge. I do nothing. The judge has given the thing. Allah has already decreed your death. What are you going to tell the angel of death to? He's saying, I'm acting on Allah's decree. You don't talk back to me. Let's go. So when we have this problem, death also, it becomes difficult. Salawat parabar Muhammad wa When we understand the temporary nature of our life in earth, when we understand we are on a journey, we really haven't be reached anywhere, um, we are on a journey in which we are gathering. Gathering that which we can take with us. Our attitude to things change, our attitude to our du'as change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I want to tell you here, um, he, he quotes two kinds of du'a in Surah Baqarah. He says, look, ayat is 200 and 201. Okay? There is a group of people who always say to me that, Ya Allah, give me in dunya. Give me this dunya. Give me that in dunya. Give me that in dunya. Okay? He doesn't then comment whether he gives them or not. Some he gives. He may give. Sometimes he doesn't give. But then he says, وَمَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ he has never asked for akhirah, so there's nothing in akhirah for him. He keeps asking for dunya. Sometimes I give him, sometimes I withhold, but he never asked for akhirah. Right? And this is another very instructive thing. We have got to start changing our personal du'as to mirror those of Aima alayhi salam, in which they always ask for akhirah. Have you had any du'a from the imam that does not mention akhirah? Always mention Yet, many times when we recite these du'as, fine. But when we make our personal du'as in sajda, shukr, or in du'a, we always say, Ya Allah, you know, make my children successful. Make this particular problem go away. Ya Allah, you know, 
this particular issue I have right now I need from you. Ya Allah, increase me in my rizq. Fine. That is, that is good. Dua is mustahab. Dua is something where you show your neediness to. But let us also at one point say, Ya Allah, when I leave this world, let me have something out there. You know, let me have something I can say. Somebody hands it to me and says, here, this was you sent that fourth. Here it is. Right. Well, we need to remember that when we ask, because otherwise we are mistake of this ayah. This ayah doesn't say that these people are mushrikeen, kafirin, muslimin. No, that doesn't make any comment on this. They are asking Allah, so they are probably Muslims or believers in Allah. Okay, they are not bad people. However, they've got it wrong. Because Allah says, "For bin nasi man yaqulu Rabbana atina fi dunya, wa malahu fil akhirati min khalaq." You never asked for akhirah, so okay, that thing was preserved for you there. And then He goes on to say, "Wa min hum." Next verse, "Man yaqulu Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fil akhirati hasana, wa kina adab al nar." And then there is another person who asks. You know, there are two things here. When people compare these two verses, they say the first person asks for dunya and the other person asks for dunya and akhirah. That is true. So first of all, the one fadila and merit they have over the previous group is that they ask equally for dunya and akhirah. But they have a greater fadila, and that greater fadila is that they leave everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, give us in dunya only if it is good for me. Not just give me blank. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. So I want, in my understanding and in my limited sort of knowledge, I think this is good for me. I want it. But ya Allah, you you make the final decision, huh? If it is hasana, give it to me. Otherwise, don't oh, don't listen to my dua. Wa fil akhirati hasan. So this is something that a believer prays conditionally by leaving it to Allah and saying, Ya Allah. If in every sequence or every every situation this is good for me, give it to me, please. If there is in within it some bala for me that I will that I will lose my religion, I will you know have it will be to my detriment. Withhold it from me. Withhold it from me. Because sometimes when we don't do this and we rely on our own judgment, those things which we are convinced will bring us happiness, convinced, hundred percent, may become the source of our misery. Isn't it the same thing that whenever you think about, you think, yeah, I want this, I want this, I want. and when you get it, after a while you say, I don't want this. This is balafa. It's happened. I've had sometimes, you know, young men come and say, Abbas uncle, get me this girl. <laughs> Why are you telling me? Her, her, her father's your friend, and I'm your student. Abbas uncle, I try a nice guy. I want this girl. Why do you want this girl? Have you met? Have you talked? Have you met? No, no. If I have her, I will be happy. And then after a few years, Ya Allah, yeah, Abbas Akhil, man, this girl's driving me around the bend. She's the source of my misery. Every day I wake up at her and think, Ya Allah, kill me or her, one of us. <laughs> Why? Because, you know, we, we, we say, I know this. How do you know this? You know nothing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, isn't it? Why don't we leave it to him? We talked about this, tawakkal. Ya Allah, I want this conditionally. At the moment, I see it good, but give it to me if you see it good too. Right? And then whatever comes, at least you can say, I may not understand this, but there is khair in this somewhere. It looks real bad at the moment, but I asked Allah to give me only if it was good. He gave me. Now I have to live with this. There is khair in this. I will discover that khair somewhere along the line. Isn't it? You know, and when I use men for metaphors, I mean the other way around most of the time as well. Uh, let the ladies be reassured, actually. So, this is how we are taught to pray. Wala hajatan laka. If there is a haja I have and in it there is salah for me, there is goodness for me, then Ya Allah, please bring it to fruition. Do not leave it uh, unanswered. And this is where I brought for you one from Bihar al Anwar I was reading. There's an interesting story there where we have um, one man, a farmer, he once visits Nabi Sulaiman. <coughs> And Sulaiman is talking to birds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we taught him the language of the birds. And he's talking to animals. The animals come, they petition him, they have difficulties. He, he listens to them, he understands them, he sorts them out. Sulaiman, uh, the this man is a farmer. He says to Sulaiman, this is such a great gift. I wish I had it. Pray Allah, he gives me this. Sulaiman said, why? Why? 
He said, I'm a farmer. Can you imagine if I knew what the cow was actually feeling and what the goat was actually thinking? I could serve them better and all this, you know, I would know what's going on. So Sulaiman said, leave this. This is not what you think. He said, no, pray Allah, I want it. So this man prayed. Sulaiman said, Ya Allah, you listen to his prayer. Suddenly, lo and behold, this person could understand the same language that, that Sulaiman was understanding. And he was so happy. He said, now watch what I do. So he's listening to the animals. He can hear the cow speak, the chicken speak, and all this. And he thinks, this is ni'mah. This is very good. Until he, he sees the dog is complaining. The dog is complaining that I am so hungry these days. I'm really hungry. And uh, the chicken said to him that, don't worry. Tomorrow that cow who gives so much milk to him, who everybody in the land really envies, that cow is going to die. When that cow dies, people will come to say sorry and all this. There will be food. We will get food. <coughs> ah, so now this man says, see, I knew it was going to come handy one day. He takes that cow to the market and gets a good price for it. People are stunned. Why is he selling the cow? He gets his money and he comes back saying, I told Sulaiman that this would be good for me. A couple of days later, the dog is saying to the chicken, what happened? I'm starving. He said, yeah, well, you know the slave that he had who is like his son. Yeah, he's going to die too. When he dies, people will come and there will be food and we will get. This man takes the slave to the market. The slave says to him, Aka, I have served you like your son. Have I, what have I done wrong? Where have I displeased you? I've always been so loyal. He said, no, I don't want to hear it. Let's go. He takes him to the market and sells. This dog is complaining to the chicken that nothing you're doing is working out. The chicken said, don't worry, tomorrow he's dying. <laughs> he's dying himself. And people will come. And when people come, there'll be plenty of food and we'll get. What does he do now? What does he do now? He kept rushing to the prophet. He said, there's a big problem here now. He said, what is the problem? This is the problem. Sulaiman asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what is happening. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that his time to die had come. Instead of his death as a sadaqa for to protect him from this bala, I was going to take his slave instead. To protect the slave, I was going to take the life of the cow. And these would have become sadaqa to protect the life of the other two. This man has removed all the sadaqas out of his way. Those things that were going to be daf ul bala for him are no longer in his life. So, he has to die. Because when we give sadaqah, we put away bala. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala averts the bala that is heading towards us by directing it to something else. There are many things if you don't know, it's better for us. Isn't it? So when we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us have that trust, the tawakkul to say, Ya Allah, give me. Yes, I want this. In my knowledge, this is something very great. I need this. But you only give it to me. And you say this each and every time. Ya Allah, you only give it to me if there's hasana in it. Otherwise, you know what? Deny my request. I don't mind. Atidi fi dunya hasana. And then leave it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa tawakkal ala Allah. What will come, then you say, Ya Allah, always I asked you in this way. That means always that what has come, I've got to deal with it. Because there is hasana. And I am satisfied there is hasana. I may not see it, but I'm satisfied because I asked you in that way. You must have given me in that way. In this there is hasana and let us proceed. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this realization. We need to understand that what death is, it is not an end. In fact, it is a marvelous beginning of something in which the soul is finally free of the body which was trying to stop it from flourishing. However, it needs preparation. And if we are prepared, then Imam alayhi salam says, Imam Hassan salawatullah salam alayhi salam says, that the dunya is like a prison for the believer. It is a prison for the believer. And he longs to escape it. And Amir al-Mu'minil al-Islam in Khutbah Muttaqid says the same thing. That for the Muttaqid, the, 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 if he was not that he had a duty in dunya, he would have long left it and flew off, flew off to Akhirah or flew off to the next world. But he has a duty. And so he must subsist in dunya for a while. But he feels trapped and he feels that he is in a prison but Imam Ali Salam said, but for the sinner, for the sinner, this is the only last place left for him. And he does not want to leave it because what awaits for him is perdition. What awaits for him is much worse 
than, than where he is now. Inshallah ta'ala, if tomorrow I just want to finish up one more thing, I notice the time is finishing. So we will inshallah discuss it tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to understand really, to understand the position of dunya and the position of akhirah. Not that we ignore the dunya, but we understand the dunya and what it actually, keep it in its perspective, you know. And when we interact with it, we interact with it proportionally. Not that we go out of control, okay. Or when things, you know, go wrong, we be, you know, when things go right, we dance in the streets as if dunya, you know, has gone right for us, mashallah. And when things go wrong, we go to the doctor for antidepressant tablets. No, we keep a medium path. It's a game. Keep it in perspective. There will be the good days, but there will be the bad days. Okay? So, inshallah, may Allah give us this realization. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. On this night, I want to start by looking at the martyrs from the family of Banu Hashim because we know that as we remember the Ali bin Hussein, Ali Akbar bin Hussein alayhi salam, uh, we know that he was the first martyr from Banu Hashim. Uh, uh, and uh, I want just to spend briefly to, real, to, to, to count the other martyrs. When we say that we had 18, as is popularly known, Banu Hashim who are martyred, who are they? They deserve mention. So I will mention them now. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate their status even higher, inshallah. And may Allah keep us in the company, in their company on the Day of Judgment. Inshallah ta'ala. The first four, and they're not in order of their martyrdom, are Abbas alayhi salam, Abdullah, Ja'far, and Uthman. These are the sons of Amirul Mu'mineen, and their mother is Fatima Ummul Banin. Then five and six are Abdullah and Abu Bakr. These are sons of Imam Ali alayhi salam, and their mother is Layla, daughter of <coughs> Mas'ud al Thakafi. Then we have Ali Akbar and Ali al Asghar. These are sons of Imam Hussein. Ali Akbar's mother is also Layla, but different Layla, and Ali Asghar's mother is Rabab. Then we have Abu Bakr, Abdullah, and Qasim. These three are the sons of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Then we have Aun and Muhammad. These are the sons of Abdullah bin Jafar and Zainab salamullahi alayha. Then we have Abdullah Jafar and Abdul Rahman, sons of Aqil and brothers of Muslim bin Aqil. Then we have Muhammad, who was the son of Abu Sa'id, the son of Aqil. Abu Sa'id himself had passed away, uh, but this young boy had come with his uncles and he was also martyred. One of the last to be martyred when he saw Imam Hussain alayhi salam, you know, with shimmer and so on, he went there and, uh, you know, as the sword came, he tried to stop it and his arm was severed and then he was killed. And the 18th is Imam alayhi salam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us in their company, inshallah. Wa On the day of Ashura, we find in Maqtal that when the Ashab had all gone, all gone and all had been useful to Imam alayhi salam, that now, the time for Banu Hashim came. And Ali Akbar, the youthful son of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the apple of his eye, he stands now in front of his father. <coughs> Again, I always ask you that imagination is required. A young boy, 18 year old, in front of his father. And the conversation is about death and permission to go and die. What do you think has gone on the heart of Abu Abdullah Hussain when he watches Ali Akbar? And he knows that what he is being asked to, he cannot say no. So Ali Akbar comes and says, Baba, give me permission. To which <coughs> Imam Hussain alayhi salam replies that, Ya Ali, Wallah, if my grandfather was in my place, I too also would have gone first. But why don't you go and say farewell to your aunt? The people of Maktal say that when Ali Akbar went into the tent of the ladies who were his relatives, a great sound of weeping broke out. And women began to cry. I said several times Ali Al Akbar would try to come out of the tent. Again, he would be called into the tent. It was like the ladies did not want him to go. And Sakina said to her brother, 
Oh, Bhaiya, all brother, all those who have gone today have not returned. All those who have gone have not returned. Finally, finally, Imam Hussain alayhi salam says farewell to Hazrat Ali Akbar alayhi salam. And in most of the maqtals, today I quote from Luhuf of Ibn Taus, in most of them we have that he raises his voice and says, Oh Allah, bear witness that I am sending to them the one who most resembles your Prophet. Oh Allah, in his voice, in his features, in his manner, when we wanted to be reminded of our grandfather, we used to look at Ali al-Akbar. Ali al-Akbar goes, as he comes down the ramp that there was there to enter into the battlefield, he senses there is someone behind him. He looks back and he sees Hussein shuffling behind him slowly. And he says to him, Father, he comes off the horse, Father, was there something else? And Hussein says to him, Ali Akbar Beta, I wish, I wish you also had children and you would know how hard it is on Hussein to watch his youthful son go. I just want to see you for as long as I can. Taqaddam Bunayya, go, go. He fights very well. Akbar fights very well. He was a trained soldier. He was in his prime. He fought really well and is amongst the only ones who are mentioned that went in, maybe Abbas also, went into the battlefield and returned. When he returned, Imam Hussain alayhi salam looks at him and says, Marhaba, Marhaba my son, I watched your battle. You did very well. At that time, Ali al-Akbar says to him, Baba, thirst is killing me. Thirst is killing me and my armor, the armor I wear is sapping my strength. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never, never show a man a time when his son looks at him and says, Baba, can I have some water? And the man is not able to give him that water. Imam alayhi salam says to him, that I take off your armor, Ali. Take off your armor, go back. Go back to the battle. Your grandfather waits for you in Hawth Kawthar. He waits for you with the water of Kawthar. And when you drink that, my son, you will never be thirsty again. Go. Ali Akbar Ali Salam <coughs> comes. Now I quote to you from Maqtal of Al-Bukarram and Maqtal al Hussein. It says that when Ali al-Akbar went, this time the enemy found that they could not fight against him because he was killing them. So against Muruva, against chivalry, they surrounded him. This was not right. They were supposed to fight him one by one. And Murra bin Munkid Bal'oon, he said that, Wallah, I will strike such a blow on this boy that it will cause his father's heart to bleed. And he went behind him. He went behind him. Akbar is fighting people from in front of him when Murrah comes with a spear and he hits it at the boy so hard, so hard that he plucks him off the horse. And then Akbar alayhi salam, is coming on the ground with the point of a spear coming out of his chest and he cries out, Ya Abi, alayka minni salam. Most of the companions had cried out to Hussein and said, Adrikni, Ya Aba Abdullah, come to my aid, Ya Aba Abdullah. But Akbar only sends a farewell salam. We don't know whether that was because he did not want his father to see him in this manner. He just said, oh father, accept my last salam. The people who were watching Hussein, they report a strange sign. They say when Hussein heard these voices, he came into the battlefield, but it was as if he could not see. It was as if his eyes had been robbed of vision. <coughs> and he was saying, Ya Ali, Aina anta Ya Ali, Aina anta Ya Ali, where are you, where are you? Finally he comes, he comes to the side, he comes to the side of Ali al-Akbar. Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam is in the last part of his life. Imam alayhi salam falls down next to him and he sees that Akbar has got his hand on his chest. He is trying to hide his wound. Imam alayhi salam says to him, Oh my son, remove your hand so I may see what has happened to you, how you have been hurt. When Akbar removes his hand, Mawla sees that it is actually the head of a spear that is coming out of his boy's chest. Imam alayhi salam grasps that, grasps with the two hands and says, Ya Ali, and removes that. As he removes that, the boy's blood comes out and he goes into heaven. And Imam alayhi salam recites a mercy there and says to him, Ya Bunayya, Allah dunya ba'dakal afa. Oh, my son, 
after you have gone, everything is just dust and ashes. <laughs> and then he looks back, and he looks back at the Banu Hashim young men, and he says to them, come, come and carry your brother away. <laughs>